The Battle of the Bulge was the largest American ground battle against the Germans in World War II. However, a lesser-known confrontation during the opening days of Germany's massive Ardennes counteroffensive was the catalyst that set back the Reich's plans in the Western theater. Protected by several pivotal hills and close to the Ardennes forest, the town of saint vith was the epicenter of six crucial roads and located right on the right flank of the German offensive's advance. For days on end, the U.S. Army's 7th Armored Division fought an exhaustive battle against six German divisions that pummeled them with incessant fire and determination. But despite the surprise factor, terrible weather conditions, and a lack of appropriate material, the American forces at saint vith would not go down without a fight, refusing to give up the pivotal town so easily. One last stand. In September of 1944, with the Allies rapidly advancing across northern France and now deep into Belgium, World War II was heavily leaning on their side. As such, an increasingly desperate Adolf Hitler devised a new plan to tear into the Ardan Forest in Belgium. The German ruler wanted to gather a powerful army on the Western Front to try and hit a weak point in the enemy's lines, thus forcing the Allies in the area to retreat. In his mind, the British and American armies would be split in two, and a large pocket would be created around Antwerp in Belgium. Hitler also believed that with London and Washington bogged down in arguments amidst the sudden chaos, the Western Allies would not respond quickly to the attack, and would instead be forced to finally sue for peace. The dictator chose the Ardennes Forest in Belgium as the counteroffensive site, because he knew his remaining forces weren't strong enough to achieve a worthwhile victory in the East. With his most bothersome enemies behind, Hitler would then concentrate his troops there so that the soldiers would crush the Soviets once and for all. To put together the army for his master plan, the faltering Führer put in place several drastic measures. Back on the home front, the working week was extended to 60 hours to produce as much equipment as possible. In addition, every healthy man in Germany was called to participate in the Ardennes Offensive, which would eventually be known as the Battle of the Bulge. In addition, schools and theaters were closed so that more soldiers could join. The recruitment age range was expanded from 16 to 60, and most of the army's non-combat roles were eliminated. Meanwhile, all surplus Luftwaffe and Navy personnel were deployed to the battlefront. In early September, the German leader presented his ambitious plan to his top officers, with many generals pointing out critical flaws. Still, Hitler dismissed them all the Führer was ready to put up one last fight on the Western Front. Belgian Prey One of the most critical targets of the initial stages of the Battle of the Bulge was the Belgian town of saint vith as the territory lay 12 miles behind the German front lines, located in the central sector of the Ardennes battleground. Going back to the end of World War I, the Belgian town of saint vith was known for being the intersection of six strategic roads and having the only rail line in the area, which ran all the way to Germany. Capturing saint vith was also essential to isolate Allied troops into the nearby Schnee Eiffel Bridge and feed reinforcements laterally into the main thrusts by using the town's road connections. saint vith was close to the western side of the Lochine Gap, a critical valley through the densely forested ridges of the Ardennes Forest and the German offensive's axis. In dire need of fuel, the vital roads and rail center were precisely what the Germans needed to supply their massive offensive. As such, the town was considered a critical target to be taken over by several German panzer armies. Competing Forces The assignment to capture saint vith went to the 5th Panzer Army's 66th Corps, commanded by General Walter Lucht. The corps consisted of the 18th and 62nd Volksgrenadier Division, with the former holding the northern reaches of the Schnee Eiffel Bridge, while the latter bore the number of an infantry division destroyed on the Eastern Front that had been reconstituted and was now serving at full strength. Despite being such an important target, Hitler believed the Allies would not show much resistance. Critically low on fuel and with extreme confidence, the Führer then ordered General Luck to take over saint vith no later than the second day of the offensive. The leader was right. 
and just as in the decisive offensive of 1940, the Allies thinly defended the Ardon forest area, as they didn't expect any aggression at that stage in the war. Consisting of mainly American troops, the forces defending the Sambit's surroundings were new and inexperienced, while others were battle-worn and exhausted. Still, the Allies had a few units of the United States Army's 7th Armored Division, led by General Robert W. Hasbrook and General Allen W. Jones, including the remaining regiment of the 106th Infantry Division, elements of the 9th Armored Division, and the 28th Infantry Division to the south. Attack on the Border In the early morning of Saturday, December 16th, the Germans surprised the Allies and the surrounding areas of saint vith with an artillery attack. A selective artillery bombardment was unleashed on the 106th Division, located in the Schnee Eiffel Bridge, as the soldiers moved back to the division headquarters in saint vith The weather became an advantage in the initial attack, as the rain and fog drastically reduced the number of Allied reconnaissance flights. Once the attack began, the United States Armed Air Forces could not deploy close air support. In addition to using radio jamming stations, the German attack cut up telephone wires that the United States Army was using for communications, isolating the defense further and denying the Corps and Army commands any information on the events unfolding at the front line. At the same time, two regiments of the United States Army's 106th Infantry Division reported German attacks on the Schnee Eiffel Bridge before losing contact with their headquarters and their commander, Major General Alan Jones. The following day, the 106th Infantry Division and the 9th U.S. Armored Division, led by Brigadier General Bruce Clark, began to arrive at St. Fifth. The group was followed by the remaining forces of the 14th Cavalry Group, which was mostly obliterated in the initial attack. With no way to communicate, the stressed Jones made quick strategic changes and put Clark as the leader of the town's defense, well aware that his combat command unit was the most prepared to defend St. Fifth. Defending Forces A mile east of St. Fifth, an American force comprising two M1 anti-tank guns, several tank destroyers, and a group of bazooka engineers was attacked by the Germans, who were broken up after a U.S. fighter bomber engaged them directly, despite the harsh weather. During this time, Clark's reinforcements began arriving, but the movement was slow as nearby roads had plenty of traffic, from panicked truck drivers trying to escape the German onslaught to American tankers attempting to defend the front line. Without many resources at hand, Brigadier General Clark began preparing to protect the town, creating a horseshoe-shaped defense team. Clark was also able to gather the 275th Armored Field Artillery Battalion, which became the only American artillery unit in St. Fifth. That night, the German generals fought with each other on the best way to proceed, especially as the town had not fallen on the first day as expected. Ultimately, General Walter Model sent the elite Führer Begleitbrigade, an armored division initially formed to escort and protect Hitler, to crush the defenders of St. Fifth. However, the Führer Begleitbrigade and the Volksgrenadier divisions could not be organized until days later, and the American forces repelled their initial attacks with ease. These victories gave them hope, but additional German reinforcements began arriving soon, and the attacks increased in intensity, creating absolute chaos. Eye of the Tiger On December 18th, an American M8 armored car that was parked in a concealed position spotted a German Tiger I heavy tank. As the forces followed the Tiger, the M8 driver mistakenly overworked the engine and gave away their position. The Tiger's turret immediately turned around to engage them, but the American driver sped directly towards the enemy. The M8's crew came as close as 70 feet from the Tiger, enough to penetrate its rear armor by firing three shots and setting it on fire. After the close call, the M8's crew returned to its original hiding spot. By December 20th, the town of St. Fifth had not yet fallen. While the Americans on the Schnee Eiffel had surrendered days before due to the mounting attacks, the Germans had failed to break through American lines, and their casualties were quickly mounting. As such, they decided to launch a decisive attack the following day, far more ferocious than before, and spreading everywhere. Without the traffic jam of the earlier days, 
the German forces were able to attack the defenders directly, finally allowing them to breach the line in several locations. By nightfall, under orders from Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, General Clark ordered his units to retreat and head to the west, having lost almost half their strength that day. The Germans finally secured the town on the morning of December 22nd. Not enough. As the winning forces poured into the now undefended town of Somfith, the men looted the remaining American supplies and material, creating yet another traffic jam that inadvertently prevented the pursuit of the U.S. forces. However, despite the ransacking and the victory over the Allies, the materials would not be enough to aid the faltering Nazis. In the end, the Battle of Somfith claimed about 3,400 American casualties, including those taken as prisoners of war, while the material losses amounted to 59 M4 Sherman tanks, 25 armored cars, and 29 M5A1 light tanks. And while the exact figures remain unknown, it's estimated that the German casualties were similarly high to those of the Americans after days of relentless fighting. Taking the town back. Despite the loss, the swift arrival of Allied reinforcements was of considerable help, and the American soldiers' tenacious defense of the vital roads of Somfith significantly slowed the German advance. The stalled offensive required men and resources that Germany did not have, and the fuel shortages only increased because of the weather conditions, further disrupting the supply lines. By the end of the month, the German advance had come to a halt. Meanwhile, the Allied air support was finally able to reach the area, and the attack soon resumed. The town was bombed by the United States Army Air Forces and the Royal Air Force Bomber Command on December 25th and 26th. During these air and ground raids, Somvith was almost completely destroyed. Still, the Allied counterattack succeeded in pushing the Germans further back. By the end of January, the Allies had regained the positions they held six weeks earlier, and the American forces retook Somvith. As such, the Allies resumed their advance in the early spring and finally crossed into the heart of Germany. According to British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the Battle of the Bulge was, quote, undoubtedly the greatest American battle of the war. The confrontation marked the last major offensive attempted by the Axis powers on the Western Front. After the defeat, the Germans would retreat for the remainder of the war. Ultimately, the heroic defense of Saint-Vith at the beginning of the battle, though costly in both men and equipment, extensively disrupted the enemy's timetable. The brave defenders played a crucial role in defeating the last German offensive of World War II in Western Europe. Thank you for watching our video. Before you go, make sure to hit the like button and share this video with someone who might like it. And for more content about the famous Battle of the Bulge, as well as more exciting historical stories, subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels and stay tuned.